We're back on A Comedy Christmas with me, Alex Belfield, talking to one of my favourite people, and Alex Conran is the big star and the good-looking one uh, of the programme called The Real Hustle, which is just fantastic. Congratulations. How are you? Thank you. I'm very, very well. Surely Jess is the good-looking one. Come on, let's be honest here. She is, and I was just going to make that point, because <laughs> let's face it, we have quite a lot in common, you and me. We've got the same name. Yeah. Uh, but, but you're really attractive, and the ladies love you, and I'm hideous. Thank you for that. Now, now. <clears throat> yeah, well, I'll teach you some tricks, Alex, and and that'll be the way to go. I tell you what worries me about your programme. It's entertaining, it's brilliant, it's clever, it shows you how to con people and deceive people and cheat people, and I think that's really marvellous because I don't go out and pass it on. And then I think to myself, there must be a certain percentage, a very small percentage of people watching, who actually go, that's a really good way to con people. That's including us, of course. Uh, yeah, because we think, hang on a minute, this is very good. No, um, all joking aside, that percentage is, uh, well, minute if non existent. I mean, it's the same analogy, if you like, um, to say that if you're going to watch a CSI or one of those big murder investigation things, that you'll go, hey, hey I've never liked my neighbour, and that's a really good way to get rid of them and not get caught. Um, it the people who are out doing the crime they're doing it already they're not waiting for the real hustle to teach them how uh, what we found out is that you do really need a particular set of moral scruples that have to be there in the first place uh, do you know what I mean you're not waiting to be taught and also the amount of people the percentage of people who avoid being hustled or scammed through watching the show far exceeds that potential number of anybody picking up something and trying to do it and they will get caught because these things don't forget are, are done by people who that's that's what they do that they do that day in day out uh, they've been trained to do it. They, that's their job. Somebody watching something on a television program and going off and doing it, it's not really going to work. Plus the fact that when um, we're doing things that are really quite sort of workable, we do leave little bits out that would make it quite hard for you to sort of piece, piece it together. Because ultimately what we are trying to do is educate people. What it underlines to me is how much of a moron I am. For example, <laughs> until I watch your programme, when I used to come to London on the train to do interviews with all kinds of showbiz people, I'd hear bing bong, if you'd like a free coffee, go to the thing now and off I'd go, leaving my bag on my seat. Yeah. And I think I don't actually have to be hustled to be made to look stupid. We, we just leave ourselves open every single minute of every day to be scammed, don't we? It, it's true. It's it's social engineering. It's We are all trained to behave in a certain way. Uh, and the reason that is, is because our life would be a nightmare if we weren't. If every time you had to go to the bank, you had to sort of kind of interview the bank teller to make sure he's not doing anything that he shouldn't be. Or every time you went to buy a car or anything any transaction you made if if those if that social engineering wasn't in place our life would be unlivable and that's where the hustlers come in they they come in that gray area they're sort of if i always think of hackers as sort of the um, um no i always think of hustlers as the hackers of human nature that little bit that you are sort of trained to do, you know, you, you, you hear a message about beware of pickpockets and you immediately check where your wallet is. Well, a hustler learns to spot where your wallet is by using that announcement. You see, it's, it's sort of little details. But, you know, if it's any consolation, I have to tell you one thing. I um, and the team, with, along with Jess and Paul, you know, we've done over 350 scams. We're in our, we're currently shooting our seventh series. Um, we've done a lot, and I have to say we know a lot about scams, but I'll tell you one thing that will make you feel better. We are still just as open to being scammed as you are. And there must be some people out there who look for you specifically to teach you a lesson. Now, I wish you hadn't said that, because I don't want you to be giving people <laughs> any ideas like that. But I am I, I, I am sort of always looking out for that, because, um, you know, when people meet me, sometimes they go, oh, can't be scammed, eh? But I never, ever have said on record, and I don't believe it either, that I cannot be scammed. Of course I can be scammed. In fact, there was a very famous hustler who used to say that uh, to consider yourself smarter than others is the surest way to be hustled. The one that stuck out to me was valet parking. You hand your car over with the engine running and the keys in it to a man who you presume is going to take it away and park it for you and bring it back. 
and you proved it is so simple for somebody to just wear a jacket it is. and get in your car and drive off. And of course, it's so blatantly obvious. How did I not realize that? It is. It's, again, it's that social engineering. You see someone in a jacket and immediately you assume, well, that's his job. That's what he does. Um, I'll tell you a funny story. Once we wore um, high-vis jackets and we had to go to Waterloo Station and get um, sort of passport photos done. And because our offices are down by um, um, County Hall, uh, the nearest sort of place we could get pictures done was in Waterloo Station because it was one of those little booths. So uh, Paul, Jess and I uh, were wearing big fluorescent jackets and a cap. The cap had nothing on it, but it was sort of an official-looking cap. We couldn't get from one end of the station to the other without constantly being stopped from people. And they would never ask you, like, sorry, do you work here? It would immediately like, um, where do I get the train to Bournemouth from? Where can I leave my bags? Where can I get a taxi? I mean, people saw a flurry jacket and a cap and thought, right, that guy works here. I mean, I could have very easily said, oh, your bags. Certainly, if you hand them over to me, I'll, I'll meet you by the taxi rank. And I would have walked off with them. It's that social engineering thing that we keep talking about. And... The funny thing is, the more you do this sort of thing, the more you develop what we call a grift sense. And you see somebody in a flurry jacket, but you can kind of tell maybe they don't work there. You can kind of you start getting into that groove of what people look like when they're working, what people look like when they're scamming. That's a handy thing to have, but, you know, it develops over time. <laughs> well, there's an old joke, isn't there, that the old-fashioned comedians do about, I arrived at the airport and a man took my bags. He didn't work there, he just took them. Help me with this. You can take anybody's bag off mm. one of those things the that carousel. goes round, yeah. and it doesn't have to be your bag, and you can walk out and nobody knows anything more, and you think... Actually, that's bizarre that in 2008, nobody's thought about that. It's stunning. What frightens me even more, because I've done this, someone's taken my bag, or what I thought would be my bag, and I've been too embarrassed to sort of say something, because I don't want to accuse them of, <laughs> you know. But, and as it happened, they took a bag that was identical to mine. It was the same sort of make. I, I've now, I, I think we, we sort of said it on the show, I now put big stickers on mine or, or, mm. or wraps, so I, I know that that is definitely my bag, and I keep an eye on it as it comes out. But uh, no, I remember feeling ridiculous, and I thought, hang on, this guy's about to nick my bag, and I'm too embarrassed to say anything to him, just in case I've made a mistake. That time I had made a mistake, but it's the wrong way to go about it, if you, if you know what I mean. And I think that's what you teach in this programme, that if we think somebody has more power than us, we don't challenge it. And that's where the problems start, isn't it? That, that is. It's, it's, it's what we're saying, that the hustlers take control of that grey situation where an assumption is being made. So if I show you a police badge, you have no idea what a police badge looks like, by the way. I mean, I don't, and they're various around. But if someone <laughs> walks up to me with enough authority and says, I'm a policeman, here's my badge, there is that moment that I have to assume that he is telling the truth and I have to put him in that place of authority. And that's where hustlers do their magic, so to speak. They speak with enough confidence, they believe in themselves, it's like an acting role. And they go for it. And But it is absolutely scary. The reason why you don't see them coming is because they are designed specifically to go under your suspicious radar. Um, there's a big difference. If I showed... I showed up to you in the beach with a sort of a crate of whiskey and went, hey, hey you, you want to buy a bottle? You'd go, oh, <laughs> hang on a minute. But if I showed up and saying, you haven't paid for your lounger, you owe me 10 euros because I look after the place here. Well, that kind of fits in. There's nothing to arouse suspicion. And that's what we're always really careful about the show. In order for a scam to work, we have realized that it's all in the details. How did you get into this? Well, that's a sort of funny story because I have... I, I grew up in Greece. My family is Greek. I, I'm Greek. Both my parents are Greek. Um, and I grew up in Athens. And uh, my father was a gambling addict. Um, uh, quite a bad gambling addict to the point where he sort of, you know, gambled the rent money and things like that, which so it was quite unpleasant. Um, and uh, my parents divorced when I was about seven. But I was around him long enough to sort of... Um, witness what he was up to um, and he turned to fraud so I remember him uh, sort of selling a house that didn't belong to him which is funnily enough is one of the things we did in uh, Real Hustle the first series I don't really have much contact with my father but I do think a sort of a gene has been passed down to me but in the sort of the good way so to speak uh, I have a fascination for the hustle I have a 
a natural sort of like a duck to water kind of thing but i i have enough moral scruples in me to have never done it and never wanted to pursue it as as a, a proper career so in a sense i am the luckiest man in the world because i get to sort of have my fix so to speak but do it legitimately. I mean, it is a huge rush when you steal a $250,000 Porsche. I can't deny it. But then I'm comfort, comforted by the fact that I know I have to give it back because um, I wouldn't really want to do this for real. So I kind of fell into it like that. My passion was acting. Uh, I came uh, to England. I went to Lambda, studied as an actor, um, did quite well, you know, did quite a lot of TV and some, a little bit of film and quite a lot of theatre. And then I met somebody in uh, 98. I was doing a play in Chichester. Uh, an incredible actor and fantastic magician called Andy Nyman, um, who's behind all of Darren Brown's shows. He directs them and he comes up with the material. And uh, he introduced me to, to magic. And uh, I immediately just got absolutely hooked on it. Totally hooked. Um, he sort of gave me one book, which led to another, which led to another... And I just sat down from what must have been about two years, and that's all I ever did. Um, just practice magic, sleight of hand. And I became quite good at it. And then combining the magic with the acting, real hustle came up, and it was just, it was just perfect. Should we all be nervous? Because you watch this program, and you could literally, on every step of your journey through the day, be deceived by somebody. How do we keep this in perspective? Well, you have to keep it in perspective... Uh, because otherwise you'd go insane. Uh, plus the fact that there, there are things you can do to prevent all this. Just just being aware of it, you've already cut 50, 60, 70% out. Um, just by sort of keeping an open mind and kind of going, well, does, does this sound legit? Um, and it's not taking everything on face value, is it? That's yeah. the key. I mean, there is nothing wrong in um, you know, I get people coming around the house they want to read the meter. I, I just look at their badge and I call the company and say, right did you send somebody out? Great, okay, come in. Um, if I haven't got time to do that, I let them in, but I'm one foot away from them the whole time. Um, it's no-brainers like that. Um, most of the things have got a telltale sign. If somebody approaches you with an opportunity, any kind of opportunity, whether that's doing your roof tiles, your drive, um, offering you a computer that's for sale, any, any kind of opportunity that finds you, that should be one flag that should go up. Do you see what I mean? Yep. Things that find you, okay? Um, anything that has a time element on it, um, phrases like, oh, well, it's my last one. Um, oh, well, you know, I promised it to somebody else and they're going to be here in five minutes. Anything that forces you to make a decision in a limited amount of time, that's your second flag that should go up. Wait a minute, my boss did that with my last contract. <laughs> you say, sign now. <laughs> that was a con, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I see what you're saying now. Do you see what I mean? So you, you get this pattern yeah. coming up um, that it's it's... Once you get your head around it, it's actually very easy to spot these things. But as, as we said earlier, um, you can still be taken, you can still be had. There are, um, you know, they've just cracked chip and pin. There's uh, chip and pin machines that have been tapped into. There is very little you can do about that. But if you think properly and think what cards are you using... Um, where you're using them... Again, you're minimising all the risks. You, you're, it's what we said about... it's. Pickpocketing, for example, um, if somebody wants something, believe me, they'll get it. But if you make their job harder, they'll just move on to somebody else, unless they specifically have targeted you for some reason. Thank you for coming in today. It's been great talking to you. I'm such a big fan of this programme. The World's Greatest Bar Bets DVD uh, is out now. And, of course, The Real Hustle continues on the telly. And, Alex Conran, thank you very much for talking to me. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, can I have my wallet back, please? I was going to say, do you want your wallet and your watch back? <laughs> <laughs>